Um, I also can see if you guys have questions that are on your face. Um, so what we'll do is I'll go through um, the study guide material. Um, I phrased it in forms of questions. So if you guys want to answer those questions, feel free to do so. It would be beneficial for the whole group to get answers to the questions because that way you have the answer to your study guide questions, right? Um, if not, take these home with you. Look at the readings that we've done that relate to the study guide questions and answer those questions and that will prepare you for the midterm. Um, we didn't go over last on Tuesday, but I do want to know because I want to be able to get through all of this. If we do go a little bit over, is that going to be okay for everybody? Um, do you have to leave at 12 o'clock or 12.05? Um, let me know so that way um, I can know how to kind of gauge the pace of what we're going through. Um, I'll also let you guys know how many journal entries you should have by um, the time that you turn in your midterm. And I'll also go over who has fishbowled already. And if you don't hear your name, then you know that, that you need to fishbowl with the second half of the semester. Uh, we have one more student coming in, so I'll let him get logged in. And we'll get started. Um, so before I jump into the study guide review, is there any questions that you guys have about anything in particular, um, just anything as it pertains to the semester? All right. So um, as it pertains to the study guide, right, we have to think back to where we, how we start off our semester, um, engaging the people who we are investigating through this African oral tradition. So we dealt with African people. Um, so one, you must familiarize yourself with how old are African people, right? There's three acceptable answers, um, 8 million years old, right, unknown, and if you're gonna use the answer unknown, you must articulate why it's unknown. The reason being, the further that they dig, the further they investigate, the older African people become, right? And then the other acceptable answer would be um, 3.2 million years old. If you use that answer, then you'd have to um, notate that that reflects uh, Lucy or Abiyomi um, found in the region of Ethiopia, okay? So those are the three acceptable answers as it pertains to how old are African people. Um, 8 million years old, unknown, or 3.2 million years old. And again, if you use unknown, you have to articulate why it's unknown. And if you use Lucy, I'm sorry, if you use 3.2 million years old, you must mention Lucy being located in the region of Ethiopia. Um, another part that accompanies this section of our, of our lecture was African individuals prior to European contact. So you must familiarize yourself with those individuals along with um, the, what's significant about them. So what type of works they did to make them important. Um, so the first one is Narmer, a comedic pharaoh of the early dynast dynastic period, um, considered the unifier of Upper and Lower Egypt, or Kemet. Um, Imhotep, the world's first multi-genius, architect, physician, um, scribe, astrologer, etc. cetera. Agnaten, um, the pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, Kemet, ruled for 17 years. Um, he was able to convert Kemet from a polytheistic society to a monotheistic society. So a belief in multiple gods and shifting it to a belief in just one god. Um, Taharka, a great Kemetic pharaoh um, described as a military genius, also known as Starbo. We also have Mansa Musa, which was the richest man um, on the planet still to this day. So those are individuals prior to European contact and some of their significant contributions. So a question on the midterm may read like this. How old are African people? What is a significant individual prior to Europe? What is the African individual prior to European contact? And why is that individual significant, right? And that would be like question one. So you would be responsible for answering both parts of the question and also including a theoretical framework. So on the second page of your um, study guide are our theoretical frameworks. Um, so the first one that we covered, the theory, and I, and I have that in brackets, right, is African-American male theory, or AAMT. The framework, which is important, the framework is African people are resilient and resistant. African-American male, African male theory posits that African-American people, or African people are both born with an innate desire for self-determination and with a limited capacity for morality and intelligence. So that is the theory. African people are resistant and resilient with an innate capacity for brilliance. The second theory is critical race theory, CRT. The framework is counter storytelling. 
And again, that's telling stories and it's telling narratives from the standpoint of the marginalized group, not the dominated group. So what that will look like, instead of telling the discovery of America from the standpoint of Columbus, you're gonna tell the discovery of America from the standpoint of the individuals were, that were here when Columbus got to the continent, okay? So that's counter storytelling. Um, another theoretical framework is funds of knowledge. And that's the knowledge and the information that gets passed down from one generation to the next um, through community structures, through family structures and things of that nature, right? Funds of knowledge are also knowledge that does not get recognized in dominant society as being valid, right? So your, your, your grandmother's tamale recipe, um, your grandparents' uh, gumbo recipe, right? These are knowledges, those are funds of knowledge that gets passed down from generation to generation. Now, the last two theoretical frameworks we covered in passing, we didn't go into too, too much detail. So I'm not expecting you guys to know them, but if you wanna use them, then feel free, right? Um, fugitivity. So when you think about fugitivity, this direct, directly relates to the slave, the enslavement context, right? So when you're when African people were put in slaves, um, at the point that they decide to liberate themselves from the slave institution, due to the fact that you're the property of the slave owner, you, you at that point become a fugitive, right? So at the moment that you try to steal yourself away from this institution of enslavement, you become a, a fugitive. And then the act of maintaining your fugitive state is this notion behind fugitivity. So when you're you know, traveling and you're running away from the plantation, all the activities that you have to do to keep yourself free is understood as this idea of fugitivity, right? Um, maroonage is, it complements fugitivity. Maroonage is the idea of setting up a community or setting up a base once you freed yourself from the slave institution and maintaining your freedom in that base. So if you think about there's certain communities in Florida, there's certain communities in South Carolina, in Haiti, in Jamaica that are called maroon communities. And these communities are communities that were developed by slaves who freed themselves, settled in this land and set up a community based on their indigenous African practices and they maintain those communities, right? So this is this notion of maroonage. Again, I'm not expecting you guys to use those because we didn't cover those too deeply, but I want to include them that way if you wanted to use them, you could. But you should know the first three. You should know those very well. Are there any questions about the theoretical frameworks before we move into our reading? Uh, yes. Okay. So you want us to connect the theoretical frameworks with whatever the, connect, with whatever the question would be that was going to be asked in the midterm, correct? Absolutely. So you'll work your answers through a theoretical framework. So for example, if we go back to the example that I gave you guys of what the first question may be, how old are African people and, um, you know, name a significant individual part of European context. An example of answering that from using a theoretical framework may sound like this. From a counter storytelling perspective, African people could be traced back 8 million years old. One of the significant individuals from this narrative could be Mansa Musa, who is recognized as the richest man on the planet. Using a counter storytelling lens, this information becomes significant because in our dominant classroom, in our dominant society, we don't learn about these individuals or these significant happenings of these individuals, right? So that's a way that you're using the counter storytelling framework to answer the question. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So that's what I would be looking for in your answers. Any other questions on the theoretical framework? Um, please, if you are unclear, use this time to clarify because again, every time that I sign midterms or finals, I always make sure our students are running through these theoretical frameworks. The only thing that students lose points on is not using the theoretical frameworks. So I need you guys to understand that because I don't want you guys to lose unnecessary points. I don't have, I don't think you're going to have a problem with the content, but where you guys may be tripped up is not reading the question carefully and not answering the complete question and not using the theoretical frameworks. So if you're unclear about that, take this time to make yourself clear. This is the purpose of our time today. So again, is there anyone that needs more clarification or a better understanding of the theoretical framework? All right. So let's jump into the readings and then what we'll do for the readings, I'll kind of go over some points of emphasis and I'm going to ask you guys what theoretical framework you think 
fits best for that particular reading. So that way it kind of gets you working with the theoretical frameworks. So I know we start off the um, semester with the Karanga readings and the Ma'at readings. I'm not gonna really include that in our, in our um, midterms. We we're gonna start with um, the Patrice, Maladoma Patrice Somaze of Water and Spirit, right? So some of the questions that kind of the readings provoke for me and kind of get you guys to think about. You have to think about what is the significance of the name in the African context, right? But then more specifically, what is the significance of Maladoma Patrice Somay's name as it pertains to the story, right? Um, the difficulty of the English language as a means of effectively translating African occurrences. What did that mean for Somay, right? So he talks about how he was, had struggled um, writing the book because of the um, limitations of the English language. So you must familiarize yourself with that and you must be able to articulate that in your essay. Um, how does one's culture shape one's understanding of what can be and what is considered real, right? So he has this part of the, of the um, chapter where he talks about culture shaping perceptions of reality, right? And he uses the examples of Star Trek to um, lay that argument out. So familiarize yourself with that and you must know how culture shapes perceptions of reality. Um, and then also how does Somay problematize notions of primitism and modernism? Um, also tied to that piece that he wrote about Star Trek. Um, so think about how does he um, further investigate this notion of what is primitive and what is modern? through the telling of the experiences of his community watching Star Trek. And then um, towards the end of the chapter, so May articulates um, the, a modernity produces the problem of um, alienation. And then he offers a solution to the alienation. What is that solution? You must familiarize yourself with that solution. Um, is there any Questions, comments, answers someone wants to provide before we jump into Ngugi's Decolonizing the Mind. Okay, so what framework do you, would you situate of water in the spirit? So we have a few, right? We have um, counter storytelling, we have funds of knowledge, we have um, African American male theory, uh, you could also use fugitivity or maroonage. What category would you place of water in the spirit as far as a theoretical framework? I believe it could be um, critical race theory, the counter story. Okay. And, and explain why, Valerie, why you think it would be that one? Give me one second. I'm like going back and forth with my notes. Okay, take your time. If somebody wants to chime in and help her out, feel free. So check it. This is your midterm review, right? So this is my attempt to familiarize yourselves, familiarize you guys with the information that will be on your midterm. If you don't want to engage the process, you're only selling yourself short, right? These are designed to make the midterm an easier process for you. And if you choose not to take these opportunities, you're only selling yourself short. Again, as I mentioned, the theoretical frameworks become extremely important as it pertains to you receiving full points for answering the questions. So the better and the more familiar you are with the theoretical frameworks is only going to lead you to a better grade. Wait, I have a question. Does um, the counter storytelling mean that it's the story being told by somebody else? It's more so the lens of the story, right? So when, when we hear stories normally, we hear it from the vantage point or from the viewpoint of Europeans, of the colonizer, of white folks, right? Of, of the West, right? So counter storytelling is going to tell stories from the lens of indigenous people. Black people. Um, it the, also actually um, went through it, right? Yes, or, and, 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 which is a very good question. So sometimes you have white scholars telling counter storytelling narratives, right? So for example, it would be like um, 
I seen this movie. I watched this documentary called um, um, Jaguar, right? And it's a French um, documentary producer, but he's filming movement in, in West Africa, right? But he doesn't do it from the standpoint of, you know, I'm this French guy and I'm coming in to investigate this foreign culture. He lets the people who he's, um, he's um, filming take the camera and film it themselves, right? He lets the people who he's recording kind of tell the narrative of what's taking place, right? So that's a counter storytelling narrative, but it's told by somebody from a dominant society, right? But he's allowing the people who he's investigating to have their voice in the story. He's not telling the story for them. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you could be, just to kind of make it clear, you could be a white person that does work that is that counter storytelling, right? So it's the lens that you're using to tell your story. Are you telling it from a dominant standpoint, from a white gaze? Are you telling it from the gaze of those who are marginalized? That's really where you get the difference between the counter storytelling. So again, um, using the example of Christopher Columbus and discovering America, right? So if I wrote about the discovery of, of America from Christopher Columbus's standpoint, even though I'm an African scholar, right, I'm not doing counter storytelling because I'm still talking about Columbus. Does that make sense? But now if I was white and I'm talking about the discovery of America, but from the standpoint of the indigenous people who were here first, that's counter storytelling work, right? So it's not more so about who's telling the story, but from what lens is the story being told? Who is being the, who is the protagonist in the story, right? Who is the focal point of the story? That's what's gonna detail what, how it's counter storytelling. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Because I was kind of like, eh, I'm doubting if it could be that now or not. I, I think um, Funds of Knowledge or yeah. African American. Yeah. Ma My second choice. Yeah. I think that would lend closer to what um, Somme is up to, right? Because he's talking about how his culture from um, Burkina Faso allows him to travel through the world, right? Allows him to make sense of the world. So it's about his culture passing down knowledge from generation to generation that allows him to pre present himself as, a, as an active agent in the spaces that he occupies. So I would think that funds of knowledge or African-American male theory, because African-American male theory speaks to the innate brilliance, right? And the resilience and the resourcefulness of African people, which is also articulated in that first chapter by so many. So for me, um, those would be, those would fit closer, but you could use counter storytelling. You can make that work. You know what I mean? If you could articulate that in a way that makes sense, because it's still to some degree, a counter storytelling narrative, because most stories don't take the focus on indigenous African people, right? They're going to look at the, the French priests who came in and took Maladoma way to the, to the um, seminary schools, right? So it's more so what's the subject matter What's the focus is going to determine, determine who they're going to determine counter storytelling. Um, is there any other questions about so maybe before we jump into Ngugi? So the next reading is Thiango the, uh, the, the um, Ngugi's Decolonizing the Mind, the Politics of African Language, of Language and African Literature, excuse me. Um, so questions that are posed from this reading. Um, he articulates the cause of problems in Africa. And the way he does it says, a lot of people assume the problems in Africa are, are caused by this, but it's not this, it's actually this, right? So know what he's talking about and what, those, what causes those problems. You should familiarize yourself with that. Um, he opens up the article with that, so you should find that in the very beginning. Um, another thing to think about or to familiarize yourself with how does Ngugi understand the role of language as it pertains to shaping culture? So this is also very much tied to what Maladoma Patrice Somme is up to, right? How does language shape culture and shape identity? Um, what becomes significant about the conference of African writers in the English language? So there's a whole section of the chapter where he deals with this conference of African writers in the English language. Why is that significant? Um, According to Agugi, what is the impetus of physical and spiritual subjugation, right? So he says, spiritual subjugation is caused by this. Physical subjugation is caused by this. Know what those two things are, right? That's something that you know through the reading. Um, somebody besides Valeria, what do you think would be the um, theoretical framework for this reading? Uh, 
uh, critical race theory. Which one? Oh, so you, that's fine. The, the um, funds and knowledge, sorry, the counter storytelling. So Maybe, yeah. I'm between that and funds of knowledge, but I think it's more critical race theory because he's um, examining the conversation about um, African language in the literature of European language and his own thoughts through the philosophy of African ideas and folklore um, that can be expressed through the English language while carrying the weight of his African experience in a way of communion with his ancestral home and the African surroundings. Yeah, absolutely. So funds of knowledge or counter storytelling would work fine. Even African-American male theory would work for this one. So it's just really about your ability to articulate how this framework works for what you're doing, right? So in all honesty, there is no wrong answer. It's more about how you explain why you choose this framework and how you're making this framework work for you and by default work for your readers as well. Also keep in mind, I mean, there's only three, so you're gonna have to use, you may be using some of these um, theoretical frameworks more than once, um, but not a miracle, good job, absolutely. Anybody else have any questions about Ngugi or um, a theoretical framework as it pertains to that reading? All right, so the next reading uh, is Glissant's uh, Poetics of Relation. Um, how does the juxtaposition of the written and the oral manifest according to Glissant? Um, that is on the opening page of the reading, right? He articulates that in the very beginning. Um, so you should familiarize yourself with that. Um, what is the open boat symbolic of? Um, what is Glissant provoking you to think about or to envision? Um, what is the significance of the belly of the boat being pregnant? What is, he, what is he doing with that? So you must familiarize yourself with that and be able to have a conversation around that. Um, also, the three metamorphoses of the abyss. Familiarize yourself with that. And then, um, why is Glissant so attentive to this idea of relations? Why does that become important? Also, you must know that. Um, so for Glissant, where would you situate this reading as a theoretical framework, anyone besides Miracle and Valeria? I think you will relate to the critical race theory Kind of storytelling? Yeah, storytelling, sorry. So, um, so just real quick, not to cut you off, but just know, so critical, critical race theory is the theory, right? The framework is kind of storytelling. There's a lot of frameworks under critical race theory. Just the one that we're dealing with in, our, in this class is kind of storytelling. Um, African-American male theory, that's the theory, right? The framework is that African people are resistant and resilient. So there's two separate things going on. So you want to make sure that you're using the framework in your um, answer but and not the theory. I'm sorry, go ahead. Got it, okay. So um, I lean to um, the counter storytelling mainly because he is telling it from his perspective, Glisten, mm -hmm. and he is um, expressing his culture and what what often was golden, nor was which was ignored mm -hmm. when they're on the boat, the deportation, the experience they went through and he expressed their side of the story, which was very depressing, fearful, and scary. Yeah, oh, good job. Um, but then also too, so to kind of tie this into the last question, like why is Glissant attended to relations? Um, while Helene is correct, right, that was a frightful, uh, a, tr a drastic, and a um, traumatic experience, but Glissant is also, in he's more interested in the relations that that experience produced, right? what new opportunities can be birthed through those relations. And that's really what Gleason is up to, right? Um, so you're absolutely right. But again, you can see how multiple frameworks can work for each reading, it's just depending on how you articulate that. Um, so the next reading is of, um, from Zohar Nail Hurston's of Mules and Men. Um, we must know what is the significance of folklore as it pertains to the African oral tradition, right? So again, that's a two-part question. One, dealing with folklore as a whole, and then two, how does folklore fit within the African oral tradition? 
Um, how does Hurston articulate acts of subversion? So think about um, the bear, the lion, those stories. Um, how is the griot personified in mules of, of mules and men? And remember, the griot is the individual in the African community who is responsible for passing down the stories, for passing, holding and maintaining the oral tradition of the community, right? Typically, the griot is an elder because they've seen a lot, right? So how does Zornel Hurston articulate this role of the griot in the story that she tells, right? And then uh, most clearly, what theoretical framework best fits um, Hurston's project? I think, so yeah, you could use all three, but there's one for this reading that is very, very um, particular to what she's doing. So what do you guys think besides Helena, Valeria, and Miracle, what do you think that um, theoretical framework is? Um, I think it might be funds for knowledge because each one tells a different story and it also talks about like. Yeah, absolutely, Samantha. That, I, that, I mean, again, counter storytelling could work because we're, we're telling a story that's not often told, but more specifically, this is definitely funds of knowledge. So great job. All right, so the last reading is Baldwin's Going to Meet the Man. Um, so you must familiarize yourself with the pillars of white inferiority, um, maintenance of white innocence. And, way, and that's kind of generation to generation. Yeah, and the white imagination. Um, also, so Baldwin has multiple interpretations of the Negro spiritual, right? So it's the way that Jesse viewed the spiritual is one interpretation. Um, the way that the man in the cell that Jesse was beating, um, the way that he articulated the, um, the, what the Negro spiritual was up to, that's another interpretation. Be familiar with the varying interpretations of the Negro spiritual. Um, what is the dynamics between Jesse and Otis? And what do those dynamics say about Black families raising children and then white families raising children in the context of the story, right? Remember how um, Jesse would always go to Otis to ask questions around racial experiences, which alludes to the fact that Otis's parents were having conversations with him as it pertains to race that Jesse's parents were not, right? And what is the significance of that? Um, what is the historical significance of the picnic? And how does this relate to Baldwin's story, right? And finally, this notion of epigenetics, and that's trauma being passed down from one generation to the next. Um, how does that fit within Baldwin's story? And how does it fit within Baldwin's critique of society, right? So as we talked about epigenetics, is typically focused on black people being passing down this enslavement experience from generation to generation, right? We're being attentive though, that this could not only work for black folks, it has to work for all folks, including white folks, which means they're also passing down trauma from one generation to the next. And you see that trauma play out with the main character of the story, Jesse, right? So be able to make those connections and be able to articulate that. Um, so one, someone who has not spoke yet, what theoretical framework would you provide for um, James Baldwin's going to meet the man? Um, I think that like the funds of knowledge would be like the the framework that we would use because he explains like his family unit and how their like their beliefs and then how it reflects onto the community and how Otis also has to explain to Jess how his family works and how his community works with and how like how it structures and how it compares absolutely absolutely good job I, I think one um it would be, you could try counter storytelling, but you'd have to be very critical in the way that you articulate it, right? Because the majority of the story is dealing with dominant culture, which is, you know, Jesse and, and, and his, his attempt to discover his whiteness, right? Um, but the way that that story is told is somewhat of a counter storytelling, right? You don't, you don't often hear about how um, 
white folks going to lynchings affects white folks, right? So that's a narrative that's not often told in dominant society. Um, but I think Precious is more spot on. This reflects more closely um, funds of knowledge. So those are the readings that you, you'll be responsible to know. Just to kind of give you a hint, um, if we look at the study guide, page one is going to be grouped together into one question, right? And I kind of articulated that for you guys. As um, far as the readings of Water and Spirit, and then Gooby will probably group together in one question. And then um, Glissant, he'll probably stand alone. And then I'll group Hurston and Baldwin in together into one question. So um, that, that, keep that in the back of your mind. Um, also, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys um, an old question, uh, old midterm, so you kind of get an idea of what the questions look like. Um, bear with me as I share my screen. So if we look at so if you look at question two, right? Um, I just I'm, I'm going to bring this up so, so you guys can see how there's multiple questions within one question, right? How is the how has the telling of American discovery problematized American race relations? So that's one question, right? Um, how does the work of Ivan Van Sertima seek to address this quandary? That's two questions. In your essay, you must state Van Sertima's thesis and how he lays out his arguments. Examples will be useful. So that's really three to four questions built into question number two, right? So if you don't answer how the telling of this American discovery problematizes race relations, you're going to lose points. Um, if you don't answer the part about how does the work of Van Sertima um, seek to address the quandary, you're going to lose points. If you don't um, state how Van, if you don't state Van Sertima's thesis and how he lays out those arguments, you'll lose points, right? And then again, if you don't use a theoretical framework, you'll lose points. So very realistically, one question could be worth five points. And if you don't answer all aspects of the question, then you won't get the full points. So again, the questions aren't hard as it pertains to the content, but I just can't overemphasize for you guys to really read it carefully and make sure you're answering all of the question in its entirety and then using a theoretical framework. So does that kind of give you an idea of what I mean by when I say the being three questions within one question? Does that make sense to you? Okay. Yes. All right. So what um I also will go over the um the journals. We should have seven journals that you'll turn in with your midterm. So um, Hilliard, Hilliard, and Karanga, those were all read together. Sorry, Hilliard, Hilliard, and the Kemetic Proverbs, those were all read together. So that should be one journal entry. Karanga, those were all read together. So that should be two journal entries. Um, so May, that was one. So that'll put us at three. So all of these three should be one in journal entry. So that'll give us three entries. In Gugi, that was by himself, so that would be four. And then Glissant, that would be five. Hurston's Mules and Men will be six. And then James Baldwin going to meet the man will be seven. So you should have seven journals, and you'll turn those into me um, with your midterm. Um, OK, so let's go over who has fishbowled. Um, if you don't hear your name, don't trip. Just know at the second half of the semester, you need to make sure you fishbowl. Um, if you fishbowl and you don't hear your name, send me an email and, and we'll have to discuss um, how I missed you. Um, so keep in mind also, these are both groups put together. So I don't have it divided up between group A and group B. So you know, you're know you gonna hear some names that are not in your group, no big deal. Um, Cassandra, Eileen, Cecilia, Douglas, Oscar, Melissa, Diana, Chelsea, uh, Christian, Emily, Precious, Miracle, Valeria, Cecilia, Arion, Andrea, Wasan, George, Mariana, Valeria, Samantha, Emily, Lizette, Yoko, Sandy, Alyssa, Jocelyn, Montserrat, Montserrat, Ingrid, Eileen, Esperanza, Carissa, Helena, Sherlyn, Chris, George, Janelli, Jocelyn, Jimena, and Brissa. So if you have not heard your name on this list, just know that when we um, get back to readings, you want to participate in the fishbowl to get your full points. Um, okay, 
details, like some housekeeping about the midterm. I'm going to send the midterm out to you guys sometime tomorrow. Let me get my calendar so I can give you guys specific dates. So the 23rd, the midterm will be sent out. The midterm is due by the 28th, which is Wednesday. It has to be turned in to me before um, 10.50. So before, our before the time our class would normally start, you must submit to me the midterm. Um, there's two forms or two ways to submit the midterm. You can submit it via your Google Classroom site. Um, I'll also email you guys the midterm. You can email me back the midterm and, and that'll be sufficient also. If you email me back the midterm, the subject line should, should look like this. I'm gonna put it in the chat. So in the subject line, the classroom um, class number, right? PS, PAS 1500-01, the midterm, and then your last name. Um, just for me, I have a lot of emails and just gonna allow me to kind of get through those a lot faster. So if you're gonna email it to me, make sure your subject line looks like that. Um, add it as an attachment, don't put it in the email. Um, add it as an attachment. Um, Word, sorry, add it as a PDF. Which I'll just keep it like that. That's the easiest way to go about it. Convert the document to a PDF and send it to me as an email PDF. Um, or submit it to the Google Classroom site. Is there any questions about anything that we've covered so far? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Okay, so is the, so the midterm, is it three separate like five paragraph essays or are we just answering the questions in like, cause I don't know what I'm trying to explain. So, You'll give us three questions and we just answer those questions? So I'm gonna give you five questions. Okay. And you'll just choose three of the five questions to answer. Okay. So, so for example, I'm gonna go back to the old midterm. So um, see here, you have question one, two, three, four, five, six. There'll only be five, there won't be six. So you can choose any of these five questions and just choose three of the five to answer. And then that's, that's going to make up your midterm. But again, you just want to make sure that you're answering the questions thoroughly. Every aspect of the question, you're making sure you address that. So it doesn't have to be. So for example, the, the example that I use about question two, right? Um, how has the telling of American discovery problematized American race relations? You don't have to answer that like separate from the second part of the question, right? So how does the work of Van Sertum must seek to address the quandary? Those shouldn't be two separate answers. Your one paragraph answer should include all of that into the paragraph. Does that answer your question, Miracle? Yeah, that's why I was um, confused. I wasn't sure if the one question we chose was in one paragraph or if we were separating. Yes, yeah, that's, that's, actually, that's actually a good question. Um, so no, um, you're going to, so you have to look at, Although for question two, there's like three questions built into that one question, think about it as one question, right? So you would choose, so let's just say for me, I would choose question two, question th three, and question six. And those will be the questions that I'm gonna answer in my midterm. But I know within question two, question three, question six, I'm gonna answer every component of those questions using a theoretical framework. Does that make more sense? Yes. Okay. Um, any other questions about anything pertaining to the semester? Um, I had a question. So like our response to the question should be at least a paragraph long or? Um, I'm not going to give you a, 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 a limit. I just want you to answer the question thoroughly, right? And like, like no bullshit. I've seen um, on previous midterms where a student has answered all of those questions in three sentences using a theoretical framework. And, and it was an A, because they answered every component of the question. I've also seen people write three, four paragraphs, and they don't get full credit because they didn't use the theoretical framework, or they forgot one component of the question. So I'm not concerned pretty as much with the length as I am with getting everything addressed. All right. Yeah. Anybody else? Does anybody, <coughs> excuse me, does anybody want to take some time and go through and try to answer some of the questions that are on the midterm outline? So we have another, what, 
20 minutes. If y'all good, then y'all good. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to hold you over if you don't have no, any more questions. But I do want to allow you the time to get all of your questions answered. Because it's y'all great. I already, I already got my degree. Um, could you go over the journals again? I didn't get them when you set them earlier. Absolutely. All right. So for um, weeks one through three, there should be um, two journals entries. So we'll have Hilliard, Hilliard, and Comedic Proverbs. That would be one entry. Um, all of the Karanga text, that would be two entries. So for weeks one through three, you should have two journal entries. Um, weeks four through seven, so May, so May, and so May, that will be one entry, so that will give you three. In Gugi, that will give you four. Glissant, that will give you five. So weeks one through seven should give you a total of five entries. And then weeks 11 through, sorry, weeks eight through 11 will give you um, Hurston's Mules and Men would be six. And then Baldwin. Baldwin and Baldwin would be seven. So we should have a total of seven entries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right. Well, I'm gonna um, we'll call it a day. If you guys have any questions, you know, shoot me an email. Um, sometime tomorrow you will receive the midterm. Give yourself time to get that done. Like, don't try to wait till last minute. Wait until last minute will allow you to forget to use a theoretical framework or allow you to miss a component of the question. So give yourself time to do it. Um, I would suggest also looking through your journal notes to kind of familiarize yourself with those readings. Um, when you take your test, have those journal notes handy so that way you can just refer to those back real quick. Um, it may be even worth rereading some of those readings. Um, it's up to you. Do whatever you do, what you need to do to make yourself comfortable um, and make yourself most efficient and effective for this. Don't stress, it really shouldn't be that easy. I'm sorry, it shouldn't be that hard, excuse me. It's not easy, but it should not be that hard. As long as you use your theoretical frameworks and as long as you answer the question in its totality, you guys should be good. Um, any other last minute question? Yeah, um, for the journals as well, will we be turning them in along with the midterm or do yeah. you want to send them separately? No, send them with your midterm. Um, so like if you're gonna, um, yeah, if you're going to email your, your midterm, have that journal attached also. I will make a, a, a link on Google Classroom to, a, uh, sorry, to submit your journal to the site as well. So when you submit your uh, midterm, make sure you accompany that midterm with a journal. Okay. Yeah. Douglas, you good? Yeah, I'm good. All right. All right. Y'all have a good one. Um, Next week, I'm um, sorry, last thing before you go. Um, next week, uh, we won't do a, a complete class. What you'll do is you will select your um, song for your project, and then we'll get with your group mates, and then that way you'll know who your group is. I'm going to scare the screen one more time. I just want to show you guys what I mean by that. Give me one second. Okay, so real quick. So if you can see, um, so here's some songs. I'll probably add about three more songs just because of the, the class is kind of large. Um, you'll pick a song based on what song you'll pick will determine your group. So naturally there's gonna be more than one, you know, individuals picking these songs. Um, you, you'll know, determining which song you pick will determine what group you have. And then you'll put together an oral presentation about the song, um, articulating the, the thesis of the song, how they went about the thesis and how it pertains to, um, you know, now. And then um, I'm just be expected to have an oral presentation for that. So next week, we will spend our time getting everyone into groups. And then um, once you're into the group, you know, you guys are good to go. And then you just need to start meeting to kind of cultivate your projects. But other than that, you guys have a good week. Have a good weekend. 
give yourself time to do those midterms and let me know if there's any question or concerns you guys have. All right.